5 a.m. and an African sunrise. The plane approaching Dar es Salaam airport in Tanzania is carrying 34 competitors and hundreds of press. They're about to start the 1991 Camel Trophy expedition and many of them have never seen Africa before. For the local population of this bustling East African state, there's wonderment too. People from 17 different nations descending on them all at once. They've never seen such an influx of equipment or frenzied activity, and the competitors themselves are about to sample the experience of a lifetime. You can tell that everybody is pretty anticipatory and they're getting excited, and I think now that that is actually happening, we're all pretty happy about being here, and uh, the excitement will show. The teams had been selected three months prior to arriving in Africa. For those individuals coming from a cooler climate, their main concern was how long it would take them to adjust to the heat. It's hot and very humid. Uh, the first impression was when we got off the plane, was we started sweating immediately. Um, and that's six o'clock in the morning, so what it's going to be like by midday, I just don't know. Piles of luggage, vast amounts of equipment, and competitors with much to learn about the country they'd come to. Well, I was in a covered truck full of luggage. I didn't see outside much, uh, but I think today and tomorrow we'll have enough time to see around a bit. So I don't know anything. Just the airport and in front of the hotel, I didn't see anything on the way here. Over the next three weeks of competition, Camel Trophy 91 would provide an opportunity to move through the heart of East Africa, abundant with some of Tanzania's most prized wildlife. From Dar es Salaam and the first set of competitive special tasks, the convoy moves through the Selas Game Reserve, continuing to the Ruaha National Park, and then on into higher land and the settlement of Mpanda, tracing the route of the explorer Dr Livingston. The latter part of the route now moving on towards the Burundi capital, Bujumbura, for the final set of challenging special tasks. Everyone who made it to Africa had been finally selected at Chateau Jeanville in Paris earlier in the year. The international selections here at uh, Chateau Jeanville and Forest Hill, the other site, are really the culmination of how we choose the teams for the event. The the selection process starts as far back as September, October, the, the year before, and this is the final, really. We've got from over a million applicants down to the final four from each country that are taking part. What we do here is try and assess which two of the four are the most uh, suitable candidates to represent the country on the event. And we do that not by having everybody compete against everybody else, but we're actually assessing the four people from each country individually as a group. So we're not looking for an overall best, we're looking for the best two from each group of four. And we do that by uh, selecting different tasks that uh, tax the, the competitor, physically, mentally, skill-wise. Okay, okay, whenever you want. A variety of physical fitness tests are designed to develop individual and team spirit in preparation for any eventuality. I've done it and I feel good and now that I've uh, slowed down some I can, I can help my teammates make them feel good because you know it's almost done for them and, and they're tired and I know they're tired so I can tell them come on and go and go and it, it, it's, it's good you know it builds team spirit and that's what we're here for. Keep it going, keep it going. Still going downhill, come on. Well done, Tim, keep it going. You've got to really uh, concentrate if you don't get through, um, as was the case for me last year. If you don't get through, you've got to concentrate and support the two guys that are actually going to go to get them to a standard where they can hopefully go out and win the trophy. Agility, initiative and team spirit are all put to the test whilst being assessed. 
So right. if, if pass the last person you get the get log all the way over, pass the log over. The last person sitting on it. Yes. Okay. Yes, we must sing it. I don't know the swing. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Number two. Put the tree, that piece of tree, through the tire, and to pull it here to the ground and cross it over. If two people are here, they can pull the rope, so the other can come down on the rope hanging by the rope. That will be the way. Hey, time's up, boys. Sorry. Over. Right. These guys have had a full day. They've had at least an hour's sleep. I've got other plans for them. All right. I'm just going to blow my whistle, and we're going to go in there and get them out. Okay, out, come on, out, out, everybody out. Get your bibs on, get your bibs on your numbers. Come on, quickly. It's not sadistic, it's necessary. Nighttime tasks are always part of the proving ground for the Camel Trophy competitor. With many bridges to cross and little sleep on the way, teams have to be ready to be pushed to the limit. Working together is vital, but it's only natural that individuals begin to appear with leadership skills. The uh, level of energy that's uh, been put into this event by everyone uh, amazes me uh, every time I see it, but this year more than ever. And it's uh, from everyone involved. The, the candidates for sure, because they know this is their last chance uh, to go on Camel Trophy 91, but the staff, the organization, a uh, tremendous amount of uh, commitment, uh, enthusiasm, and I think it's uh, evident in the success we've seen this weekend. The almost fairy tale setting of Eastner Castle was the next stop for the 34 chosen finalists to be trained in the skills of 4x4 driving. For some, it was the first time in the Land Rover Discovery. Well, I think it'd be fair to say that uh, these guys have come through quite a, a torturous uh, few weeks and they've still got more to do and uh, the object of the exercise of attending this particular event is to, to refresh the memories more than anything else and uh, add on to that a little bit more stricter training it says that uh, when they do leave us uh, we can hopefully have some uh, restful nights you know rather than uh, restless nights thinking that they may be getting into difficulties Mud, treacherous tracks and unknown terrain are everyday Camel Trophy driving conditions. This is where training and driving skills are put to the test before this Land Rover discovery not only becomes a means of transport, but also a home. expect to get a car through the, all that mud up to that hill through that water but the instructors are very good they teach you really everything they say first gear second gear turn the wheels take the winch now everything on the exact moment and if you really do what they tell you you can get so much information which helps you enormously Yellow 
trying to find the spot to hook it in and pull ourselves out of the mud. That's the, that's the point right now. Working as a unit, the driver and navigator are able to coordinate the winching techniques to pull the discovery out of almost any mud hole. Over 25,000 people uh, applied uh, for going to Tanzania uh, in Turkey and this is my fourth year applying for the Camel Trophy and going to the national selections. Uh, I've made it to the last four uh, and I went to the Canary Islands for the uh, international selections but I didn't make it that year. So this is my fourth year and I'm very glad uh, I qualified uh, to go to Tanzania this year. With the event scheduled to coincide with the rainy season in Africa, a wet England in April offered very similar muddy conditions. Is everything all right? I think the rainy season is uh, just beginning and uh, the first uh, way we have to take is uh, through a national park and I read in a book that it's uh, not passable during the rainy season so I think that's just the right terrain for a camel trophy. Yes, I think that in Africa now, in this moment, the sky is cloudy and raining too much, the tropical raining. You know, in, about uh, 10 minutes, uh, 15 minutes, only raining. That's, I think that is no problem. But when the vehicles and all the supplies arrived in Africa, the climatic conditions were far from wet. Dar es Salaam, the haven of peace, started out as a humble fishing village in the mid-19th century. But since that time, it's continued to grow and is now a city of almost one and a half million people. This city was to play host and see the start of the 1991 Camel Trophy event. The competitors' vehicles and the support vehicles lined up in CMC Motors, the local Land Rover dealer, for final preparation prior to the start. 1991 was the second year that the Land Rover Discovery was to be used. This year saw the use of a five-door version for the first time. Teams were given a maximum of two hours to familiarize and prepare their vehicles before setting off. The standard TDI discoveries are only slightly modified, mainly through the use of stiffer shock absorbers. The tightening of wheel nuts, general last-minute checks, national artistry and provision of any available creature comfort helps abate pre-event nerves. It's time to check the toolkit, check and recheck the winch. All components of the pack of accessories provided on the Land Rover that can mean the difference between success and failure. Competing in such heat requires large quantities of water. The teams stock up, but these supplies would only last the first few days. We got a pump filter with us, uh, and we got uh, special drops to uh, make the water clean. That should be enough. Mm, 1.5 liter bottles, um, 92 bottles, yeah. 
We're going to carry about 45 litres in all, um, which we're probably going to need to replace every two days. Um, because of the, I mean, as, as you can see, um, it's, the sweat will pour out until we get more acclimatised. Um, so we're probably going to be drinking in the region of four, four to six litres of uh, water a day per person. Keeping luggage to a minimum and utilising the maximum space from the vehicle, the two-man teams were ready to pit their skills for this great adventure and finally test their strength and their courage against the elements. And with such a large international sporting event taking place on Tanzanian soil, the government lent every support possible. The colourful national send-off was extended to the start of Camel Trophy Tanzania Burundi 1991. The police band, dancers and even snake dancers performed in front of an audience of ambassadors and dignitaries from 14 nations and media from around the world. And for the competitors, not just the chance to represent their countries, but the honour of meeting President Winyi of Tanzania. The Belgian team will have a good record on Camel Trophy, having won the Spirit, Team Spirit Award in 1989. Thank you, Belgium, as I say. The young man proudly represents their nation. Kaoru Shoji and Hideo Mukoyama. They've got lots of supporters here today. There we are, the traditional Japanese bow. Thank you, Team Japan. The Polish team entered Camel Trophy for the first time, just as Russia had done the year before. The enthusiasm of the Poles overflowed as 25,000 applied for the two solitary places on the Polish team. A 39-year-old university professor and a 27-year-old student finally made the grade. His Excellency, President Winyi of Tanzania, endured the searing heat to flag off the 29 vehicles. Eight months' work for the management team was ending, and the day and a half of preparation, celebrations, dinners, and official engagements for the competitors was finally over, and the event was at last underway. The long convoy trailed out of Dar es Salaam past an estimated half a million people, and for the teams, the amazing size and enthusiasm of the crowds lining the street en masse from the city was to make a lasting impression. The American team, the experience had been truly moving. The convoy was uh, uh, it was awesome, uh, very emotional. Um, they were yelling "Yay, America!" and uh, "George Bush!" and uh, every time you could tell that the crowd picked up when we came through, and it was uh, you know it would bring tears to my eyes. Very emotional for me. Once out of the city, the first special task site tested the use of vehicle equipment, including the kilometer recording territory. The Japanese team were the first away on task one, leaving the Turks to ponder over the instructions and their training as they waited to start next. The high bank on the left, little corners, and on the right hand side there are big ones.
Testing tracks proved not too difficult during these early stages for the Americans. The Poles, however, following a similar line, found some surprising ruts at the top of one of the first crests. How's it been for you on the first task? Oh, very, very funny. Why? Eh? Why funny? Why? why? The roar is it's okay. I think that it's better if running. But okay. But you enjoyed it? Yes, of course. The team from the Canary Islands seem to enjoy their driving, though with perhaps a slightly more aggressive approach, a technique to be seen at a later stage in the convoy. The Swiss team got straight into the thick of the action, team members gelling with their backseat journalists from the beginning. This navigation and terror trip exercise is not about speed, but about covering set distances at steady average speeds, taxing nonetheless. The competition section becomes even more taxing when you have to compete at night in the jungle and interpret all the instructions. Peter Wildham and Josef Altman, like the 16 other national teams, were competing in this maneuverability task in order to gain more points in the Camel Trophy competition section. Points scored here would be counted together with votes by individual teams on national performance for the team spirit section. The combined scores would eventually provide the overall winner of Camel Trophy, Tanzania, Burundi, 1991. The team of competition experts worked for a month before the start, selecting and rechecking the tasks conceived under the direction of Terry Harriman. The Chief Marshal, Paul Ridgway, and Assistant Competitions Director, Paul White, ensure everything is run to the rules. It was a camel night. <laughs> Very much, yes, much too much to, to up here. We didn't break down anything, at least that was very good. We took the wrong way on a very deep mud part. Uh, we had to winch a lot, uh, bent one of these things, and uh, but the car's okay. More tasks followed on the second day as the Dutch team of Marcel van Bemmel and Jan Peppers negotiated tracks, this time in daylight. The French duo of Jean-Pierre Chautagna and Jérôme Cruyff were settling down nicely into the pattern of special task aptitude as the journalists applauded their manoeuvres. The German team of Andreas Bublat and Wolfram Edgen were enthusiastic, whilst the Canary Islanders were keen to score highly as their colleagues had from the year before by taking the Camel Trophy Team Spirit Award. The Swiss, Kara and Krebs continued to perform smoothly the mode of communication in the vehicle being English. And the Greeks were enjoying the task as Thanasis Papadimitrou and Thanasis Chundras showed, just managing to stop at the checkpoint. Over-enthusiasm got the better of the Yugoslavs on their country's second ever entry into the Camel Trophy. Everything is okay? Yeah. Roman, Roman, okay? Thank you. Give your hand, give your hand. Okay. okay. Cars on their side aren't particularly unusual, pretty unusual on special tasks actually. Um, unfortunately a case of uh, too much haste and not enough speed. Uh, the guys are still excited, still fired up and they're tending to panic a little bit. Um, I mean there's no damage, there's nobody hurt. Okay, done. The Yugoslavs back on their wheels, and none the worse for wear, as the scores show after the first set of tasks. Turkey ahead with 92 points, and in second place, Austria on 87, Great Britain in third on 81, and there they are, Yugoslavia in fourth place on 70 points, and in fifth position, it's the Dutch with 64. We didn't expect such a result. I mean, our actual aim was to be in the first five, and we did stick to that uh, objective. I mean. What happened is we were in the first five all the time and other teams pushed us to the front.
Following the special tasks, the convoy moved on through the night towards the Rufiji River, 180 kilometers south of Dar es Salaam. The Land Rovers had taken a pounding, particularly the Japanese Discovery, which broke a track rod, and of course the Yugoslav car, although both were now running perfectly. Already the teams were short of sleep, just a couple of hours snatched in the last 56. And then in deep black sticky cotton, 20 kilometers south of Marina Mango, the convoy was held back. Then the first bridging began, as Britain's Andrew Street disappeared backwards as he guided a vehicle in the dark. You all right, boy? That's yeah, right. It's okay. It's okay. Don't die on me. Yeah. It's a pain. It's a pain. It's okay. It's okay. I'll give you a cigarette back. It's a empty movie. I stepped back and tripped over the log that was on the floor and fell down the hole. Um, as I fell backwards, I grabbed, tried to grab hold of something and dislocated my shoulder on the way down. <laughs> um, it's not uncommon. I do it quite a lot playing rugby. Um, and I know how to put it back in. It's not a problem. Heavy rain during the previous night and throughout the day produced treacherous conditions along the rising ground in the south. Back into action within minutes, Street and the rest of the teams were busy in the dark trying to negotiate the heavy workshop driven by Paul Gunn over the ladders. The makeshift bridge nearly disintegrating under the sheer weight of the heavily laden but vital vehicle. It was a precarious operation, but experienced hands like the Belgian Frank de Witt were on hand to help and guide. They're going to winch him now, that wheel is going up and he's going to fall down. So we've got to be sure to secure him at the back so the back is coming up and then they can pull him forward. Steady! Go on. Go on. Hold it! Whoa. It's not going to be a snatch or anything, it's just going to be a smooth... The German team were experiencing mechanical problems that would blight their car for days to come, as Wolfram Edgen explained. Um, it's uh, the main uh, difference. We thought it uh, would be the front of the finisher, but it isn't. So it uh, wasn't worth taking uh, the half shaft off, but we did it. Alois Nasuki from the Ministry of Tourism was on hand to smooth the path through some spectacular country. The Sulis is the biggest in the world. The Fiji River, there's been such epics as the African Queen was shot on the Fiji River just behind it. And it's poaching with wildlife, everything from crocodiles, hippos, lion, elephant, buffalo. It really is something to be seen. Still with only hours of sleep to fortify them, the convoy made its way carefully through the eastern perimeter of the Cellus Game Reserve. Running for part of the way with the Rufiji River alongside, the wildlife reserve held precious sights for those lucky enough not to disturb the animals with the noise of the engines. Giraffe, wildebeest and gazelle were all spotted by the teams and added spice to the already adventurous start made on the event. The country, the trees, the mountains, all is beautiful, colourful and full of uh, life. And I feel pretty happy with all people and going on and on driving and trying to get out of the troubles and stumbles, scars and all those stuff. The Canary Islanders Alejandro Montes de Oca Marrero and Clemente Jimenez Lopez towards the back of the convoy could confirm that the tracks had worsened. The previous day had remained peaceful but by nightfall there were horrors every bit as bad as the night before. Heavy rains had fallen on the high northern ground making established tracks extremely difficult. The Italians Emilio Previtali, a 24-year-old physical education student from Bergamo, and the next Carabinieri official Carlo Rinaldi, now a salesman from Florence, confirmed the road's quality as they slogged on through the mud. It wasn't quite up to Julius Caesar's standards.
conditions worsened, throwing many competitors off balance early in the event, especially those who had praised the training, like Belgian Hurt Blondel. I thought it would start uh, the situation a little bit uh, further on. Must be a, a big surprise now that we have it uh, this early. There must have been falling a lot of rain. But uh, this is Camel, I think. Yeah. The dry and dusty conditions on the early part of the Celis Reserve had flattered to deceive. Teams referred to it as the false dawn, as parched landscape gave way to ideal Camel Trophy conditions, testing all the participants' skills. Winching and towing rescue operations continued through the day as teams suddenly started to feel jaded. That, however, didn't stop them. The Japanese carried on as if driven by robot power. Kaioru Shoji. I don't say bad, but uh, it was a trophy, yeah. And uh, we don't sleep last night, and uh, yesterday before we take a sleep just only two hours or three hours. Yes. And gets a little bit tired. A great start to Camel Trophy 1991 because uh, the conditions have changed so much. It's got so wet when we thought it was going to be dry. It's bogged everybody down. It's made it really tough. By now, the clay had been replaced by soil the consistency of coffee powder. Mixed with frequent showers, it became quicksand, which slowed man and machine dramatically. Progress was blunted. Three kilometers per hour was a good rate, as the Germans struggled on with no center diff and no winch. The Spanish helped them, but by early evening, not only was the convoy split into two groups, but they all collectively faced another night without sleep and solid work. The teams laboriously laid sand ladders across long bogs, working until sunup, inching their way forward, as half a meter of sand tracks were laid, pulled up and laid again to take four team vehicles across at a time. As the first heat hit them, so did the realization that water stocks were low, but the clearer streams eluded them. Now they had to filter the water their Land Rovers had just driven through. At this point, spirits were low. One thing spurred them on. Once the vehicles found solid ground, the teams could put kilometers under their belts, like the Japanese here. But the next moment, it was back to the sand ladders. But if you could make it under your own steam, what a great feeling, especially for your trusty machine, as Irvin Kara related. It's a good car. I start to like that car. It's extremely flexible in the axles, which keeps the traction all the time, which keeps you moving, especially in this kind of soft ground. It helps a lot. Well, uh, we uh, yeah. got a slight problem with the comms car. He ran out of clutch, and if there's one vehicle we really need, it's the communication car, because that's the uh, only uh, rely with uh, the outer world. So we're making our pit to be able to repair the clutch. So I hope tomorrow this car will be fixed and we keep on going. Whilst the clutch was repaired, there were further problems at the tail. The workshop, together with volunteers, Poland and Belgium, waited with Germany for its new diff to be delivered by air at a small clearing. They were to wait nearly three days. Our job today is to try and motivate everybody to go through the night and possibly tomorrow night as well, otherwise we're not going to make it. I mean, there'll be a great sense of achievement when we do, but um, that is the current situation. Strain on man, men, strain on the machinery, um, but we think we can keep it all going. After 16 hours in one swamp, the convoy was now split into four distinct groups, but at least the communications car was running again with its new clutch, and back in river beating form.
Whilst event manager Ian Chapman, together with the USA, France and Britain, pushed on ahead towards Makumi, two days ahead of everyone else, the middle order still struggled on. The tired Greeks lost concentration and fell off the road, fortunately without injury. But it was righted by the teams in 20 minutes after an extremely slick rescue operation. Ian is in fact uh, working day and night in Makumi where they've got a relay station, in other words the, you know, the brains of the operation, the HQ there, and he's running things from there. We've e he's even sent out uh, members of the British team to come back and the lead scout who's sitting at the river crossing ahead waiting to help people over. Um, extra fuel's being sent down because some of the vehicles are running short of diesel again. Um, and Ian has given me the program for the route which will change after we regroup from Makumi. We've basically just got everybody through uh, that was in the group. Um, there's about eight cars still out there, about a day behind. Um, and that was our objective so we can get the convoy moving again. The US team wanted more action. More adventure and to get on the road again and get the teams working all together again and have the whole convoy together and uh, see more animals. The animals are the most awesome part of the Africa that we've seen. You get right up on top of them before they see you if you're the advanced party. After three days of toil and endless routine, the fractured convoy straggled into Mikumi to regroup by a welcoming campfire. We was dragging them rovers through with a winch in our hands. <laughs> there was the Italians there, there was the Canary Islands too. <laughs> there was Turks and Belgians and Hollands and Dutch and Americans there also. <laughs> On day 11 of Camel Trophy, 23 cars set off from Mikumi by highway, the crews having enjoyed their first proper meal and sleep since Dar es Salaam. Where we are right now is at Oringa, which is uh, probably two-fifths of the way through the route. The last 150 kilometres has been quite good because we've been on the main road from Mikumi. Uh, the last time we saw you, as you say, was in the, the safari park, on safari, in the sun, in the reasonably dry going and since then we had a minor uh, a minor problem on the road there was a lot of mud there's a lot of holes and it's taken us uh, a bit longer to get through the Kisaki Mikumi stretch than we anticipated but it's been good fun I think most of the guys have enjoyed it the the hardware you can see is suffering a wee bit but there again it's uh, most of it's cosmetic we've still got about 1200 kilometers to go uh, the road over here is blocked, so we're going to have to make an, an unscheduled detour, but keep watching, it's going to get better. Just 470 kilometers have been covered in 11 days to Iringa as the Rongwa Game Reserve beckoned. But although on the move again, the tail group with Lead Scout and Duncan Barber's car had only just reached Mikumi. There were over a thousand kilometers left to run, but Ian Chapman was still hopeful. The good news is the Germans, the Poles, the Belgians, Workshop One, Mark Day and Duncan Barber are now out of the mire at Mikumi. In fact, they're at the mission at Mikumi. They arrived there at 10 o'clock last night. So if all goes well, and they set off in the next hour or so, they're probably about, well, travelling light with six cars, they're maybe seven, seven and a half hours behind us.
So the organizers and teams were happy with the prospect of regrouping and here were executing a safe water crossing. The sort of moment at which the unwary can be reminded that anything can happen on Camel Trophy, especially if you lose concentration just for a moment. Cheers turned to concern as Ian Chapman rushed forward to the day's crew. Luckily, it was just stitches for Marcel van Bemmel. Then Dr. Mike Irani's ambulance, driven by Bob Ives, arrived to patch things up. Well, they still went back and it feels almost as good as you. Well, almost. Got it. Okay. Okay. The Japanese showed the correct route, but afterwards Marcel talked us through the accident. A little bit to the right, but it's a little uh, uh, sledding to the right, so it keeps sledding. So I, there was nothing there. And when you stay to the left, it goes always, so I tried to stay to the right, just to go that way, but it's a little bit too, too more degrees, so it fell off. No way. We're not breaking any We're not of our This river crossing deep in the Rungwa game reserve was easily navigable. However, once up on the far bank, the convoy was to encounter its most confusing period so far. Piano piano, Emilio. Vehicles searched for the path as new undergrowth covered the tracks. Progress was thwarted yet again as route plotting took precedence and Ian Chapman called a summit meeting to explain the predicament. It's like a needle in a haystack. However, we, we know the lie of the ground, we know the topography. Uh, we're going to pack up now and we're going to set off at first light. There's a river just over the back here, well, a river bed. And uh, when we strike that, turn to the right which is northwest and eventually that should bring us out in some of the feeder tracks in the game reserve further north i hope ah ti pesnya pesenka devichka ti vichi za yasnay tonkom sled i raitsu na dalnym pograniche at padru piridai privet at camp on the 12th night of the convoy, spirits were lifted as twinkling lights heralded the arrival of the tail end Charlies. Germany, Poland and Belgium together with their unsung hero escorts. It was quite a hard job, but now we are very happy to arrive here and uh, all the people are here from uh, the other teams and they, are, they look so happy and uh, that's the reason why we are happy too. The Belgians' reward for bringing up the rear was to trailblaze at the front. But long grass still obscured old tracks and thorns provided plenty of punctures as the route finding continued unabated. Yeah, but you went to complete the left side, so you have to go straight. Yeah. Oh, it's only this one. This one is to follow. This, this yeah, side. I think we should follow the way we yeah. were going. Yeah, because it went very fast. Over. And uh, maybe from... Having made up nearly four of the six days delay to the schedule by travelling day and night, the convoy were about to lose the momentum in the maze of Rungwa reserve tracks. By following two peaks in the distance, the convoy finally broke through across a river to the correct route on day 14. Livingston would have been proud of them. Then came a welcome rest at the briefing at Rungwa town. But we do need to be 
in the Mpanda area tonight, and then hopefully, all being well and the weather holding good, then we should be up the road from Mpanda to Kasulu, which is getting us close to the Burundi border by this time tomorrow night. So we've got two long days of driving. But two long days of driving were interrupted by an unscheduled one kilometer long swamp. 12 hours of painful progress further sapped the strength of the weary competitors, as Ian Chapman himself took charge of the morale-breaking exercise. Well, we thought we'd left the worst of the ground behind us, uh, and we had, to a large extent. But Sod's Law comes into operation, and the very last stretch of black cotton uh, was pretty wet in the middle, and it extended to a kilometre eventually. So the first car got through that around 3.30 yesterday afternoon. And the last one didn't get through until about quarter to four this morning, so that was about 12 hours to get the, the 29 cars through that. Feeling a bit sleepy and he's just dropped off of the wheel and careered off into the edge of the, uh, uh, the fields. Um, obviously, you know, the, the guys have been under a lot of pressure over the last few days and uh, with it, um, you know, having worked all night last night, you know, tiredness is setting in, it's getting towards the end of the event. But uh, they should be taking more care about this sort of thing. Any, uh, the first sign of feeling tired, they should swap over with someone else. 36 hours of continuous driving produced inevitable results. The shattered Polish team left the road, but regained it intact, thanks to a tow. They resumed the drive with the rest of the convoy to Mpanda, and on to Kasulu, a further 284 kilometers away. Now, with less obstacles and the border with Burundi in sight, the mood of the convoy heightened. They are feeling so elated now. They're feeling this sense of achievement that they're close to the goal, to Burundi and the final task areas. They're now starting to think more about the final uh, special task rather than the hardships that they've endured on the, on the convoy section. They're getting excited. Uh, there's a great atmosphere amongst all the teams. They've all been working together really, really well. A little bit of disappointment, they haven't seen as many wild animals as they'd wanted, you know, the odd giraffe for breakfast and things. But, um, you know, there's, there's this tremendous mood in the camp now as we move uh, into Burundi. Once over the border, the 17 teams were not only in Burundi, but in special task mode, ready for the event's finale. I start very goodly, but we, we make a few mistakes in understanding English and uh, that makes us go, uh, going down to the six. Night tasks produced difficult route finding through crocodile infested rivers. Only brave teams got out to winch, but Spain's Fernando Castaneda didn't care. The helicopter pilot from Madrid and his team, they were happy because their original immobile car had been swapped with Duncan Barbers so they could complete the tasks. Well, there was a very nice detail on the organization part. Uh, they uh, landed us the uh, event coordinator, Duncan Barber's car. And, well, can you, you can see they even have extra stickers and things like this. I don't know if it was in case of something like this happening or whatever, but they, they we just had to fix a few things on this car and uh, we're ready. Light on our terror trip is not working. And since this is a uh, night task, we need that light. But uh, since we couldn't fix it, uh, and most of the people who are involved with these special tasks, uh, they are out in the field, uh, there's no one who could help us at the moment. So we'll try our best with what we, we got. Take it away to your own car. The four people in that car take 10, 15 minutes to think about it and fill it in. Once you've filled it in, put it back in the envelope, seal it, sign across the the sticker on the envelope and bring it back to me because once you fill them in nobody knows what those votes relate to until sometime tomorrow when they're opened fed into the computer and the, the voting is converted to a point this year the overall camel trophy would be awarded on the basis of points accumulated in the special tasks plus those gained from the team spirit voting 
but with a bias in the computation towards general team spirit shown during the event. And competitors required spirit for task K, especially as the normally very agreeable Tony Carette of Belgium ran four kilometers instead of the prescribed 1.5. By the time he'd swapped with driver Blondel, he was totally confused. Not so Emilio Previtali. After checking the instructions and with compass in hand, he set off at a good pace down the course, where at a set point he was to swap with Carlo Rinaldi, whose turn it was to run and orientate himself. The Italians were fourth on this task. The last two tasks put the emphasis back on driving. Each crew and their journalists were allowed to walk the course first around a very tough maneuverability track that called not just for accuracy, but agility too. the knowledge that it was the penultimate task, teams really worked their Land Rover discoveries hard. But of course, for those at the top of the competition table, Austria, United Kingdom, Turkey and France, it was to prove a tense final few hours. Having been on convoy together with just the jungle and animals for company, teams were playing out the final act in front of an appreciative media audience, and some just played to the cameras. Others were simply showing off. While Terry Harriman and his team tallied the scores from the previous tasks, the final curtain was about to fall. The last task could have really been the final straw that broke the discoverer's back. The French managed to fly with style and keep up their fight in the competition section. Fighting with the Turkish team for the third place. And so, and now we don't know. We, we are looking forward to know if we are third or fourth. But it was a very good close, challenge. Close, 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 close. Yeah, challenge. one or two points between yes, us. And it will be uh, peanuts. The British team of Street and Dre were fighting for first place in the Camel Trophy competition section, but they completed the task too quickly, although Tim Dre wasn't so sure. I hope we haven't fluffed it. I just think we've uh, probably come in a bit too quick just there. No, 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 no. Um, I suppose we've done it in a minute, I think. I think we're probably just a bit under. No, we'll under, under. We'll see. The Austrians, they scaled the mountainous logs with a calculated indifference. They stayed in the target time, whereas the British received a penalty for finishing too quickly. Terry Harriman, the competition's director, announced the results of the final tasks. First, uh, Austria, who won by one point, 179 points to 178 points of the UK team. Third, France with 141. Fourth, Turkey, the early leaders with 129. And fifth, Yugoslavia with 128. Quite close. Mm. An experience you won't forget? No, no. Yes, I'm quite sure. <laughs> it is something special anyway. If it is, it could be possible to travel around in these countries on your own, but all the thing together is quite an experience.
Congratulations, anyway. Well done. Thank you, Anthony. And the Team Spirit Award. The individual national teams had all voted by scoring secret ballot papers and awarding marks to each of the other 16 competitors, excluding themselves on disciplines such as mechanical aptitude and helpfulness. The result? Turkey with 523, second place Belgium on 464, the Greeks third, the Swiss fourth, and the USA fifth. But the big award for the amalgamation of all the points was still to come. Okay. The winner, Camel Trophy, 1991, total points and special tasks, and the team spirit vote. The team from yeah. Turkey! Yeah. Turkey had a total points accumulative of 652 to win Camel Trophy, 1991. An overall win for Turkey for Menderes Utku and Bulland Osla with 652 points. The Swiss in second place. In third place, the Belgians, Blondel and Caret. Then fourth, the Greeks. And in fifth place, the team from the United Kingdom. And Bulland Osla and Menderes Utku were justifiably pleased with the result. We're, we're really delighted. I mean, we really worked hard. And you were there. You saw us. We were together all along with the camera crew as well. And... I really, I'm so glad about it, and because I think this is really winning. 17 countries voting for you, making the winner, that means we deserved it.